Okay, so hello everybody. Just to, let's say, get you in a backup mode for a minute, I'll actually start by stealing two minutes of your life. Actually, one of my favorite clips on YouTube when it comes to the backup. So just enjoy the two minutes, and then we will, of course, talk about Veeam, talk about backup. I'll show you what we actually have. All those backups seem no waste to pay. Now my files have all gone away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, there's not half the files they used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. The system crashed so suddenly. I pushed something wrong, what it was I couldn't say. Now my data's gone, how I long for yesterday, yesterday. The need for backup seems so far away. Now I need a place to hide away. I pushed something wrong, what it was I couldn't say. Now my data's gone, how I long for yesterday, yesterday. The need for backup seems so far away, now I need a place to hide. So, generally, this is why we are here. We're the backup guys. We are here to save your infrastructure, to make sure you're not this guy who needs to hide away right now because he lost everything and he is, okay, just waiting. Come on, let it be yesterday. Let me recover everything. So, just to start with, because my name is Thomas, I am from Veeam, and I will be talking today about a newer version of our product, which will be coming out uh, approximately in a month. How many of you actually know about Veeam already? have heard of it, maybe have used it, have tried it. It's a couple people, but not, not that many. So for those of you who don't know Veeam, I have a couple, like three, three introduction slides. So just to give you a very brief idea of what Veeam is. Veeam started out in approximately 2008. This is when version one was released of our flagship product, the backup and replication software. We we're always focused on virtualized environments. It was from the very beginning, VMware, we, all, we were like a small company, always next to VMware, so whenever, wherever VMware went, there was us, whatever VMware introduced, we tried to integrate with it, just to make sure we will this fast, nimble backup for virtualization. Of course, at that time, it was uh, like six years ago, this was, a, this was a pretty big niche. So if you look at, look at the market, if we went to customers, we ask them, okay, so how many virtual servers do you have? They're like, maybe none, maybe one, maybe two. I mean, this is just starting, it's not production, it's not production ready, it's just for development. If we go right now, if we actually see what's going on, they tell us, well, let's say 80% of our infrastructure is already virtualized. So they are actually, right now, moving to virtualization as their primary infrastructure, and this is what we are providing. We are providing a virtualization specialized product for them just to allow them to recover the data in the fastest possible way. As I told you, we started as a VMware only company, but then Microsoft released Hyper-V 2.0, starting with the Server 2008 R2, which was actually, I don't wanna say anything about the first Hyper-V, but it was actually usable, right? Then they released Hyper-V 3.0. Many, many of the customers that we see right now say, okay, this is actually very good. They're catching up to VMware in certain areas. They have surpassed VMware in terms of ease of use or maybe ease of configuration. So for us, it was simple. I mean, more and more people moved to Hyper-V, so we also started to support Hyper-V. We made a technology alliance with Microsoft just to also allow those people to save the data to make sure it's backed up, and of course to recover it consistently. 
So anything I'll be talking to you about today is both for VMware and for Hyper-V. There are no differences in terms of Vim functionalities. Of course, if you look at uh, if you look at certain mechanisms, some of them are, for example, not required in terms of Hyper-V. If you look at storage integration that we have, like uh, the ability to use storage-based snapshots, Hyper-V basically has it by default. You use the hardware VSS provider, you do a snapshot, everything is backed up nicely. In VMware, it's slightly different because it's not the host operating system that's actually integrating with the storage, so we introduced our own mechanisms to do it. But just keep in mind, if you have VMware right now, for example, or you have Hyper-V right now, you buy Veeam, of course, you can use it. If you ever decide to switch your environment or you want to make it a hybrid environment, all you have to do is just drop us an email. We'll send you a new license file for both VMware and Hyper-V environments. So both of them can be protected using Veeam, using the single console, single product that you have. When it comes to functionalities, everybody can do backup, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but still, I mean, backup as such is a simple task. It's just taking the data, putting in some sort of a container. Everybody can do full VM recoveries. Again, probably the simplest scenario that you have is just streaming the data from the container to your production environment. In Veeam, we also allow people to do certain things faster, do certain things better, just to make sure, again, that they're not the guy who lost the data and is not able to recover it, or takes so long to recover the data that, well, he's gonna get fired anyway. A functionality that we actually introduced in 2010, so if you look at it, it's actually four years since it's on the market. Right now, of course, it's being more and more popular, but still, this was, let's say, the first uh, the first rendition of this functionality, something we call the vPower technology. Basically, what it allows you to do is boot up a virtual machine directly from your backup file without restoring anything to your production storage, without actually even touching the production storage as such. Thanks to that, it does not matter of the size of the virtual machine. You can simply recover it in approximately two or three minutes because you're simply using the backup file as a source for this particular VM. So if you look at a specific disaster scenario, okay, so you have a huge, let's say, environment, you have some primary storage array, and something happens, it goes down, I don't know, maybe power supplies just go out because there was a power surge, whatever, right? So you basically just lost your production storage. All you have is that regular, you know, backup storage array. You cannot recover anything to production because you know it's not gonna work, you don't have production storage. All you have is those backups that have been lying around for a couple weeks, couple months, doing absolutely nothing. So this is a way for you to actually put those backups to work. You can start as many VMs as you want. The only limitation that you're gonna face is the performance of the backup storage itself. This is the only thing. How many VMs you actually put up, it's up to you. What do you do with the servers afterwards? It's also up to you. If maybe after a couple hours or a couple days, those uh, hardware guys come, okay, they fix the problem, maybe they replace your storage array, then of course you don't want to lose the data that you just changed using this technology. So you don't want to do, lose any of the data that you created since, uh, since the downtime of your environment. So just migrate those machines using native mechanisms live migration, or storage of emotion. It's very simple. Basically, Veeam will allow you to do it to simply migrate this data from a backup file on the fly without any additional downtime to your production environment. We also had a client very recently. It was actually on one of the, one of the POCs that I did. For them, Exchange was basically a critical application. They had almost uh, 5,000 mailboxes that they, had to, uh, that they had to take care of. The server itself, along with all its disks, was over, I believe, 12 terabytes of data, right? Of course, the databases, the mailboxes, everything, the logs of the Exchange server itself. With this functionality, from the complete downtime, up to a point where the server was actually booted up and the exchange service was started, it took us four and a half minutes to actually get this VM running. Of course, because you're using the backup file, it's slightly slower, but still, if you're looking at a 12 terabyte virtual machine and you're looking at a 4.5 minute downtime window, this is actually a pretty, pretty impressive way to do that. 
However, sometimes you do not really want to recover the full VM, either regularly or using this instant VM recovery mechanism. So of course we allow you to go down into slightly more granular level. So for example, individual files or going even further, especially when it comes to Microsoft application, specific application items. With files, for those of you who know Vim already, with Windows it was always pretty good because you could just have such a browser and there was a very cool restore button which simply re-injected the file back to the original location of the virtual machine, right? So basically just re-inject it to the client's machine without any additional workload on your side without any agents on the target side of this VM. In version eight, we'll also introduce exactly the same mechanism for Linux. So as of right now, any file system which is supported by VMware in terms of vSphere or by Microsoft in terms of Hyper-V will also be supported by us in terms of re-injecting those recovered files back to their original locations. So the idea in here is to put as little workload on the backup administrator as possible and also because we're doing this agentless, it will be pretty easy simply to maintain this environment, to upkeep everything, to make sure everything is working as smoothly as possible. About application items, I'll tell you a little bit later, coming to a different slide, but just keep in mind that it's there. So coming with version eight, as I told you, it will be coming out in approximately one month, but I can tell you about some of the functionalities that will be presented during this release. So, if, again, if you know Veeam, then you know that in version seven we introduced something we called the Veeam Explorer for send snapshots and the backup of storage snapshots. Two functionalities relating to storage arrays. As of right now, only compatible with HP left hands and with three bars. In version eight, we're also introducing this same functionality for NetApp storage arrays, anything running on ONTAP 8.1 and newer. So if you look at those two functionalities, they actually serve also two different purposes while still using your storage to your advantage in terms of data protection. So what you're seeing right here is actually the first one. This is the, ah, it's the second one on the slide. Veeam Explorer for SAN snapshots. The idea behind this functionality, if you look at the scenario, like for example, you have a SQL guy coming up to the backup admin saying, okay, I need a backup of my SQL server like right now. So the backup admin looks, okay, it's a two terabyte server, I will have it ready in, I don't know, four hours. SQL admin tells him, okay, that's not gonna work because I need it right now. But because you have HP or because you have NetApp, what you can do is you can actually take a regular storage snapshot, storage-based snapshot, and because Veeam has integration, because Veeam can actually understand the contents of the snapshot, what you will see is this virtual machine actually being part of a snapshot. Right, so because of that, because we are able to simply do a very quick storage snapshot, we're also able to recover full virtual machines, we're also able to recover individual files, again, also application items from a storage snapshot, not from something that actually Veeam created. So it can be a, can be a storage admin who created the snapshot. If you want to, of course, it can also be a backup administrator. So again, you can consider this to be like a very short-term retention backup just for your convenience if you have specific storage arrays. The second functionality, the, we call it the boss backup of storage snapshots, is again, using the storage snapshot, but this time to help you create a backup file with Veeam using the Veeam container for archival purposes. So if you look at the regular backup, especially when it comes to, when it comes to VMware, you do a snapshot, right, the Delta file is created, and of course you read the data from the snapshot, the Delta file grows. After you finish the backup, the snapshot is being committed. Usually it's not a problem, unless you have some very high I.O. server, like I don't know, maybe a, maybe a database, maybe some, uh, some very busy file server, something like this, and then you start committing the snapshot, the storage array is not able to handle the workload, the IO stack of the host is not able to handle the workload, and you start getting timeouts on the virtual machine, you start actually to lose services, they're not responding, so basically the service might go down for a couple minutes, sometimes in a very bad scenarios, maybe for a couple hours. Not exactly the thing that you want during a backup, especially if you want to create a backup during the day because you have to create it, let's say, every two hours. So with backup of storage snapshots, what we're able to use is actually utilize this storage snapshot to keep the backup as fast as possible. 
Now there is a small catch, so to speak, because we are still using the VMware snapshot in the very beginning. But the reason for this is actually very simple. We have to create the VMware snapshot in order to ensure the quiescence of the virtual machine to make sure everything is consistent when we do the backup. Because while creating a snapshot, we're also able to inject certain, uh, certain code, let's say, for a SQL server to truncate logs or for Active Directory so we understand, okay, we are backing up a domain controller and after we store it, we want to restore it in non-authoritative mode just to understand what we are backing up. And right after this VMware snapshot is created, we do a snap, the storage snapshot, and then we immediately commit the VMware snapshot. So from VMware's perspective, backup takes like three minutes, maybe, again, regardless of the size of the VM. And then we simply take the data, read it from the storage snapshot, and create a regular backup file. Of course, after everything is completed, we clean up the infrastructure so everything looks nice. The, the, the storage guys are not gonna come running to you telling you, okay, so I have some orphan snapshot or whatever. But keep in mind, if you have HP or in version 8, if you have NetApp, this is actually the preferred way to do it. Also, if Vim figures out that there is such an array connected, this is also gonna be the default mode of your backup because it's faster, because it's less stressful for your virtual environment. Second thing, this is actually a, a set of enhancements for the people who have been using also replication with Veeam. If you look at the product name, Veeam Backup and Replication, of course it does say, well, we do have backup regular, and we can also replicate full virtual machines to other locations. So there are a couple things. One of them, the simplest one, is the failover plan. So this is basically like an SRM-like functionality if you look at the software version, not the, uh, not the hard hardware replication version. So if you have two, two different locations, you have a primary site and you have some sort of a disaster recovery site, you want to create some sort of a plan what happens during a disaster. So you can specify, okay, this particular VM should be turned off first because this is a domain controller. Let's set a specific delay, maybe add some particular scripts to this VM, then power up this VM, blah, 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 right? And then after something goes wrong, after you actually lose the primary site, all you want to do is just click a button and the disaster recovery site just starts booting up in the order that you specified just to make sure that everything will be running as fast as possible and again without any additional reconfiguration. So this is basically just like a one click failover possibility for your entire environment given that you actually uh, specified the rules that should, be, that should be followed. The second thing, this is probably something that people who are using Vim right now already know. We introduced something we call the one accelerator for Vim backups. If you look again at a scenario where you have a primary site and maybe you have a secondary site, both of them are very powerful, you're like a huge, I don't know, company, but for some reason you have a very weak link between the two locations, right? Okay, so you have like hundreds of terabytes of data or tens of terabytes of data to send every single day and a slow link in between. It's not possible to exactly stream the backups, even if you're only doing the changes, even if you're only doing incrementals, anything like this. This is why we introduced D1 Accelerator. It's not a standalone, let's say, product. It's not, a, it's not an appliance. This is actually a software one accelerator. It's integrated into Veeam. It was written by Veeam, and it's only usable for Veeam, backup, uh, Veeam backups or Veeam replicas. So this accelerator is a way for you to sacrifice IOPS because it's actually a pretty IO intensive operation to use the one accelerator, but you will conserve your network bandwidth. From the test that we did, production-wise, you're gonna see approximately 40, 50 times less data sent over the network using this accelerator technology. But again, keep in mind that, as I told you, you're sacrificing IOPS for, uh, for throughput. So if it happens that you have, uh, let's say, weak storage infrastructure, but a very strong link between the two locations, probably you don't want to use it because it's simply gonna be slower for you. You'll be wasting too much resources on something that's not exactly necessary. But if you have a slow link, or again, if you have too much data to send so you cannot actually pass it through the link, this is probably a way for you to try and do it. And the last thing that we did in replication is we're right now able to use the backup as a source for your replicas. So this is again, similar thing to what I told you about uh, storage snapshots. 
If you create both backups and replicas, you don't want to create two snapshots every single time. You don't want to commit to snapshots, again, especially on high I.O. servers. So right now, if you create, let's say, a backup once a day, and you want the exact same copy, but of a live virtual machine on the target location, you can simply point Veeam to this particular file, and it will send it to an offset location. It will host the virtual machine, and this virtual machine will be ready for the failover operation to be completed. So again, you decrease the number of snapshots, you decrease, let's say, the, the workload on your infrastructure, you put a little bit more of it on your backup, not on your virtualization. And because in version eight, we really try to, try to help people who are sending the data offsite, we started running into, into simple problems like, okay, it's not a problem if you have two of your own locations, you have everything privately owned. But if it happens that you have a primary site and you're maybe renting a disaster recovery site in some service provider, you probably don't want to stream him your backups because, well, there's absolutely, let's say, no security over that. Somebody comes there, just takes away your files, and has access to your, to your data. So this is also why we introduced encryption in version eight. Encryption will be possible on, let's say, three different layers. One, the one I told you about, is the, backup, the encryption at rest. So basically, the backup file itself will be encrypted on its own. If, however, you have a scenario where you have two of your own locations, but the link between the locations is, for example, rented, you're not 100% sure of it, you can encrypt simply the network traffic between Veeam components. And of course, the third option, you can simply combine the two just to make sure that anything that leaves your location will be already safe. We're using single algorithm, the AES 256-bit. There are two reasons for, for this algorithm to be used. First of all, it actually has certain military-grade certifications, so it was one of the stronger algorithms. This is one thing. And the second thing, I would say like 99% of the CPUs right now have hardware acceleration for it. So if you actually look at the backup speeds with encryption enabled, it's gonna be maybe one, two percent slower. It's not a big overhead that you actually have to take care of. It's pretty much not visible from the user perspective. There's also something we call the key management option. This is very much an optional functionality. You do not have to use it. Some people will probably not use it. But this is a fail-safe for you. So again, imagine a scenario where you have a backup administrator. He's the only one responsible for backups. He knows all the password, everything. Then one day, he just you know, leaves for work, gets hit by a bus or whatever. Right? Then you have like 10 years of data doing absolutely nothing because nobody is able to decrypt them. Maybe if you have a quantum computer laying around, you can just crack the password, but probably not many people do. So we introduced for you a possibility to actually decrypt the backup without knowing the password. The requirement is, first of all, either it has to be decrypted in the very same location where it was created, or second of all, some management person, because this is, let's say, dedicated for, for some higher level executives, has to provide you with the security key which created this backup, right? So there's no possibility that a random guy is just gonna come, take your encrypted file, re-import it into some random Veeam installation, and he's gonna simply see his files. It's not gonna happen. Either it has to be exactly the same location where the backup was created, or you have to have the specific key exported by an executive. As I said, this is very much optional. So if you just prefer to have a regular, let's say, binary password possibility, so either you provide the password and have the backup, or you don't provide the password and you don't have the backup, this will, of course, remain very much possible. If we're talking also about offload, of course, we can also apply encryption here. In Veeam, for a very long time, actually for nearly seven years, we believe that tape is going to be dead. Tape is not going to be useful. If it is going to be useful, then not exactly for virtualization. Because for us, tape did not fit the idea of virtualization. Virtualization is supposed to be fast. It's supposed to be easy. It's, you're supposed to be able to do pretty much anything in just a couple of minutes. And then you just put this tape device, a huge library with a beautiful robot, 
and you start streaming the data sequentially, no randoms. If you want to recover something, you have to again stream all the data. You cannot just go down to single specific block and recover this particular thing. So if you're doing like a backup in a couple minutes, if you can do restores in a couple minutes, then streaming like I don't know, a five terabyte backup file from your tape device is not exactly what we wanted to do. However, it turned out after this couple of years that so many people were still using tape. First of all, because it's cheap. It's very cheap storage. It's actually a pretty, pretty durable storage if you, if you take care of it right. But also in certain countries, there is a legislation which says that certain sensitive information must be archived on magnetic devices. So of course, they're not gonna use disks. They just keep it on this tape device. So we introduced tape in version 6.5. Right now, it's also in version seven. But there was one huge problem with Veeam and with our tape, uh, with our tape implementation. It's actually the one that you have as a second point. With Veeam, you had to have the tape attached to the backup server. The backup server is actually the brain, the, the user interface, the database of your tasks. So you usually just deploy one in your environment. It wasn't exactly a problem for the people who could present their tapes through iSCSI, for example. You can do it to a physical server, you can do it to a virtual server, doesn't matter. The problem occurred if somebody had to present their tape using Fiber Channel, for example, and they deployed Veeam as virtual machines. Not exactly supported, by VMware to actually stream fiber channel to, to a virtual machine. So again, if it's not supported by them, we cannot also officially support that. So right now, just to make everything simpler, we introduced a regular tape server role, just so you can either scale out your tape infrastructure if you want to simply write, uh, write your backups to tape in a different location. It's right now possible, just send it to an offsite location and automatically write it to a server which is connected to a tape device right there. So we no longer need the central point, which is going to be, have to be connected to all the tape devices that you, have, uh, that you have available. And now, probably the coolest thing about not only version eight, but this was actually introduced in, uh, in previous versions, something we call the explorers. Again, if you look at Veeam, especially like version, version five, early version six, if you wanted to, for example, recover individual exchange items or something like this, this was very much possible, but doing that required a lot of reconfiguration, a lot of, let's say, network-related knowledge and some patience because you actually had to boot up a virtual machine, of course, using this instant VM recovery mechanism. This virtual machine had to be verified and only then it allowed you to actually recover individual items. Again, not very useful in terms of virtualization, in terms of speed, anything like this. So right now, we introduce the explorers. The explorers allow you to dig inside the backup file, find the database that you're looking for. So for example, the EDB database, the regular MDFs, or NTDS in terms of Active Directory, and simply access it from there. So you just double click on such a database file. This kind of interface appears, and you are right here in terms of Active Directory able to recover an individual user, an attribute of this user, a specific computer account, and send it directly to a working domain controller in your infrastructure. Very useful because you just dig inside the backup file itself, you do not start anything. So this is one thing. And the second thing, this does not require any agents either on the source side when you do the backup, and it does not require an agent on the target side when you re-inject this element to a production active directory. So very simple to deploy, very simple to use. And because we do not require agents, and because all we need is the database file, you don't really need a Veeam backup to be able to use this functionality. If you have a physical domain controller, you do it with, I don't know, TSM or whatever, just take this backup, do a file level recovery, find the NTDS file, copy it to a Veeam server, double click it, and you can actually recover data also from your physical machine. Because for us it doesn't matter, it's just an NTDS file, right? Or it's just an MDF file. It's just a database that we have to understand. So how you get this database, we don't care. If you use a Veeam backup, great. If you don't, it's also gonna to work. Even if you have some sort of a crash consistent backup, still, doesn't matter from our perspective, whatever is recoverable, we'll also recover that. So this is one thing. The second thing that will be introduced is such an explorer for SQL servers. So this was actually one of the biggest, biggest problems that we had with SQL. 
If you did a backup, previously you just did a snapshot, okay, so you have a recovery from this point when you created the snapshot. Of course, SQL admins either then replayed logs on their own just to have a point in time recovery or were just angry at the backup guys because they do not have this functionality. So right now, we will allow you to do point in time recoveries. In order to do this, this was actually a tricky part because we did not want to install any persistent agent on a SQL server. So what's actually happening is that VM is injecting a runtime code which is exporting logs, let's say every five minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, whatever you specify, and sending them to a Veeam server. So basically it's just an automated process. It does not require, again, any reconfiguration, and it's simply just streaming the logs as they come to a Veeam backup server. So right now, you will be able to recover a specific point in time, and we also have something we call the geek option, restore to a specific transaction. So if you have a SQL guy who actually knows what he's doing, he can choose a specific point in time, then click, go back to a specific transaction. You can find somebody, I don't know, dropping a database, deleting a row, deleting a column, whatever. And if you click this transaction, Veeam is automatically going to recover the database in the latest state before this transaction actually occurred. So just to keep it as simple as possible, again, when, without any additional reconfiguration. So these two will be added. Right now, the same thing is possible already for Exchange and for SharePoint. So you can just access individual mailboxes, user accounts. Uh, you can recover, let's say, emails, attachments, calendar events in terms of SharePoint, entire websites, some content of these websites. And these two will be, also, will be also added. But as I told you, with Exchange especially, it was kind of controversial. controversial because if you had a backup administrator, of course he should be trusted, but you know how it is. When he created an Exchange backup, with our tool, he can actually you know, just double click on it, and he sees all the emails, everything, right? Whatever the boss says, whatever accounting says, whatever HR says, doesn't matter. So in version eight, we also introduced a secondary, let's say, help desk mechanism that can be used. It's actually a web-based interface, and it's gonna be very simple, again, for help desk purposes. You specify a couple things. First of all, whose elements do you want to recover? So for example, you click CEO's mailbox, right? So I want to recover his elements. What do you want to recover? Emails, calendar items, maybe some notes, stuff like this. Okay, so I select emails. Here are also selected calendar items. So these two things I want to recover. And since when? Okay, so he deleted everything from last week. So I just click. Oh, this is actually this week. So everything from this particular week. And then all you can click is restore. You do not see the emails, you do not see the contents, you don't see how many elements were recovered. You just select who, what, and from what time. And this is it, it's automatically then being re-injected into a running Exchange server without any additional knowledge of the contents of such a file. And coming closer to the end, this is actually for some people who are maybe not using tapes, but they still want to archive their backups. Integration with the duplicating storages. Right now, of course, you can still use the appliances. It's very much possible. It's just simply not, not very optimal. But if you want to store the data for a longer period of time, the duplication appliance is actually a great idea. A problem with the duplication appliances is that, well, first of all, you should not still use them for short-term retention because of speed considerations, especially if you want to use functionalities like file level restores or like this uh, instant VM recovery mechanism. But for long-term retention, absolutely perfect. So we actually talked to EMC guys, we actually talked to Exagrid, we talked to HP, and in version eight, you'll be able to add specific the duplication storage as a repository for Veeam. So basically, you'll be able to stream the data directly to, uh, to the duplication appliance, which will understand, okay, they will, they will actually have a Veeam service already installed on their, uh, on their firmware. So with HP, there's just one thing I need, to, I need to mention, because this will not be probably coming out in version 8.0, it will be like probably 8.1, because the version of Catalyst software that was available during the creation of this functionality did not exactly handle random IOPS too well. It was great with sequentials, but the randoms were absolutely horrible, so the backups were actually slower than without, hack, without the Catalyst support. Right now, HP released a new version. It's doing much better with randoms, so it's gonna be also implemented into, into Veeam. 
In Exagrid, as I said, we're simply going to have a Veeam service which understands what's going on, which also will help with the deduplication, with the speed of calculating the blocks. And with Data Domain, we are going to introduce the support of DDBoost. So of course, just keep in mind that DDBoost is going to work one way, so it helps greatly with storing the backup itself. During the recovery process, you still have to put all those blocks together so the data domain has actually has to, has to do some work on it. So it's still not going to be as fast as a regular disk, but storing the backup itself with the use of DDBoost is approximately seven, eight times faster than before we introduced this kind of technology. Also, for those of you who maybe are using Veeam or know the concept, let's say, of a synthetic full, if you look at the duplication storages, synthetic fools are probably one of the worst things that can happen because you have, let's say, two files, or you have, I know, seven files, and out of those files you want to create a new, let's say, full backup. So from the duplication storages, regular, let's say, operation load, you have to read all those files, so you have to put the blocks together, then you have to calculate how the new file will look, and you have to write the blocks again. A lot of IOPS is gonna take probably longer than the backup actually took just to recreate this file on a duplication storage. With DDBoost support, for us right now, it's just a logical operation. No, no more IOPS are required. So basically right now, we're just talking to data domain, and we're saying, okay, so you have this block, so point it there, 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 and there. Instead of taking a couple hours, this is gonna take you maybe a couple minutes, maybe a couple seconds, depending on the type of data domain that you have. But generally, it's going to greatly increase the speed of your, of your backup creation and of the way you transform the backups themselves. And the very last thing, not exactly connected with version eight, but just something I wanted to share. We will be releasing an endpoint protection product, the Veeam endpoint protection, it will be actually free. It will be available in the beginning of, uh, of next year. So whenever you want to backup, maybe your personal laptop or your PC or whatever, you can actually try it out, this tool, as I said, it's free there. I don't think there are any plans to make a paid version as of, as of right now. We're simply just, you know, exploring what's possible, what, what we can do with the technologies that we use for virtualization. Don't, in case you actually download it, in case you use it, it's not an enterprise physical solution, so don't even try to back up like your physical SQL server, something like this. Just keep in mind this is for your own personal use, a free product. If you're using Veeam, it can also integrate into Veeam so you will see all the tasks, what's going on. You can also integrate yourself with already existing Veeam repositories, just to keep your backups all in a single, in a single place, just to make sure that everything is neat and, and possible. So as you can see right here, you can either back up an entire computer, a specific volume, or you can just do a file level backup. So basically, just a regular endpoint protection with some cool technologies uh, underneath. So this is it from my side. As I told you, this, is, this was actually a presentation about version, version eight as such. If you want to hear about the current functionalities that we also have, then you're welcome to, to, to see me on our stand. When it comes out, or if it doesn't come out yet, if you, if you still want to try, let's say, version seven, feel free to download the trial edition. By default, it's uh, 30 days full functionality. See how it works. It's very easy to install. It's just an exe file, so all you have to do is just basically click next, 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 and it's going to install itself in the, in the simplest deployment mode. Just try it out. It's worth it. It's going to be very fast, and if you try the recovery options, believe me, it will be difficult then to, let's say, go back to some, to some legacy tools and have everything just take longer than, than it should actually take. So this is it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. And as I said, hopefully either see you on the stand or feel free to try out our product. Thank you. <laughs>